Oh, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to our event this afternoon on data protection issues affecting housing management. We're uh, just watching the uh, attendee clicker counting up at the bottom of the screen, so thank you to everybody who's joined us already. We will just give it a minute or two for other people to catch up, and then we'll be able to make a start. All right, so we're a little bit past two, and we're conscious that everybody will have uh, probably about as busy afternoon and afternoon as the rest of us have. So we will get going as we have plenty to get across in the next hour. Uh, we've already had a number of questions that have come in uh, from uh, attendees. So thank you very much for those. Uh, there is a Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. If you have questions as we go along, please jump in on that. Uh, we've got some time for Q&A at the end. So we will hopefully get to all of them before the end of the session. So. Let me thank you again for your attendance and start by introducing the panel. I'm Daniel Mills, a partner in the Governance, Procurement and Information Department at Forbes. And I'm joined for today's event by three of my colleagues, uh, one of whom is a uh, special guest star who hasn't yet made it onto the opening slide. So uh, her identity is well, not really a mystery, as I suspect her name is underneath her image on the right-hand side of your screen. Uh, so we have Sarah Rogers from our housing management team who's going to bring us some frontline experience. Uh, we have Bethany Poliga uh, from the Governance Procurement and Information team. And uh, Bethany will be your main presenter today because she knows more about this than the rest of us do. And we're here to chip in around that. And the special guest star today is our colleague from the GPI team, Gemma Duxbury, who is uh, hopefully going to bring uh, some illuminating experience from her time working in-house in local government. So to advance to the next slide, please, I will uh, give it my best Chris Whitty impersonation all the way through. Thank you very much. Uh, we, we've got past the, uh, the usual small print. That is there for when you get the recording or the slides that we'll be sending out afterwards. If you have got any particular questions that you don't want to raise in the Q&A, uh, do please let us know. And we'll be happy to talk to you um, afterwards or uh, outside the presentation. So next slide, please. We have a number of things to cover today, which uh, we have found to be the most common uh, recurring issues in the interaction between data protection and housing litigation, housing management. So to start with, uh, Sarah, I will hand over to you and uh, you can get us going on how this plays out in the real world. Thanks, Dan. That's great. Yes. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Sarah Rogers. I'm a senior associate solicitor and I head up the housing management team within the housing litigation department. Um, what that means is that my team deals with mainly things like death and succession, property and garden condition, any other tenancy breaches, tenancy fraud, vexatious complainants and property abandonment. So it covers quite a, a vast range of, of topics and issues specifically within housing management. And certainly as part of my job, um, I do have to deal quite a lot with data protection issues. And so I'm extremely grateful uh, to the, the team, the, the data protection team for all the assistance that they give me. And what I'm hoping is that I might be able to be a bit of a sounding board for yourselves in terms of some of the issues you've come across, because certainly um, I have the same experiences in relation to things like uh, the police and the various different levels of engagement you get from the police, depending on where you are in the country. Because um, often they won't give me the information that I need in order to gather information for my case. And I'm sure that you probably have the same frustrations and experiences as I do. But also I genuinely need, uh, need help in determining what information I have that I'm allowed to share or situations where I want to share something, but I can't get confirmation from the defendant solicitor that they're willing to share that information. For example, an expert report with social services or something like that. So I find the work that they do extremely helpful and I'd be lost without them. And um, without further ado, I will pass you to Beth for her to deal with it. As we go on, obviously, if I think of any questions that I think you guys might be thinking as well, then I will uh, endeavour to ask them and put Beth on the spot as much as possible. Thanks, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, hi, everyone. Um, as Dan and Sarah's mentioned, my name is Bethany um, and I specialise in all things data protection. Um, but I actually do have a background in housing management and ASB, so I am on hand to regularly advise um, our housing litigation team on these matters. 
So we got some feedback from um, an ASB webinar, actually, that we um, some colleagues attended, and we understood that clients were looking for more information about data protection and the issues affecting housing management. So um, my colleagues asked me if I could put on, um, or our team could put on this, this webinar. And when we were thinking about what issues we could have, I was thinking about the common issues that come across our day on a day-to-day -day basis. And the first thing that sprung to mind was um, subject access requests. Um, because we are seeing um, it's ever and ever more prevalent and they're getting used more and more. We do um, understand that uh, some tenants or their representatives try to use a subject access request as a fishing expedition um, or that they see them as a precursor to litigation. Um, ultimately, they might try to establish what information that they have and ultimately try to assess what evidence you've got or whether there's a lack of evidence in support of their case so that they can carry out those preliminary assessments of their client's case. The bad news for um, our clients, or our housing clients, is that unfortunately we can't refuse to deal with those requests simply because we think um, that it's a precursor to litigation. That's because subject access requests are purpose blind. Um, so that means we can't look at the reason why that request is being made. And the reason for that is because the right to access your own personal information is a fundamental right that was given under data protection law. It's a real cornerstone of data protection law in, our, in this country. Um, so therefore that's why the requests are purpose blind. And even though we might know that they are using that to try to get evidence for their own case, we can't refuse on that basis. So because we can't query um, or we can't refuse to act on that request because of the reason behind it, we need to have a look at what we can put in place to make sure we're limiting that information that is being disclosed. So if you suspect that um, information is being requested because of um, litigation or you think that it's an inempting uh, litigation that's to come, you want to be really careful about the information that's being disclosed because you don't want to hand over anything that's ultimately going to be used as evidence against you if you didn't need to. So when we're looking at these type of cases, we're going to apply a really strict, strict definition of what we mean by personal data. So what is the tenant's personal data? So we're looking at anything that isn't relevant to that tenant, that isn't relevant to themselves. And we want to make sure that any of that information is not included. So again, we're not giving away any additional information that we don't need to. So once we've applied that strict definition, anything that left that is left is purely the tenant's personal data. So we've taken anything away that's not personal and we've taken anything away that relates to another person or individual. Then we're left with the information of the tenants. And this is where we look at applying our exemptions. Um, and there's a number of them under the Data Protection Act. And it's just another way of ensuring that we aren't giving out any information that we aren't legally obliged to give out. So in terms of um, housing clients where we see regularly the exemptions that are applicable, um, I've set them out on the screen for you because these will, will be useful for you to have a look at if you're ever having to respond to a subject access request. Um, so there's the general exemption that if information would prejudice an ongoing criminal investigation, then that can be withheld. Um, of course, any documents or advice, correspondence going between yourselves and your solicitors, your lawyers, that is all legally privileged. So that doesn't need to be um, provided. And also documents that you create for the purpose of legal proceedings are also exempt. So it's just being really careful applying that strict definition of personal data and then making sure you're applying all the applicable exemptions. So you're limiting that amount of information so that you can be confident that you're only giving out information which you are under a legal obligation to disclose. We have, um, I've just seen one of, one of the questions earlier, and it's a good question about what do um, tenants solicitors means when they request a house file. And this is something that must be on a template letter to solicitors. Um, it must see that they use, it says request a copy of the house file. And I think this must have been drafted a long time ago before there were any electronic records. Um, and it kind of hark backs to a, a time where that information about one property was held in a physical um, folder in a filing cabinet somewhere. <laughs> 
So it would contain things such as your housing application, uh, the rent records, uh, the repair records at the property um, and any correspondence that's gone between the tenants. Um, ultimately, it doesn't take into account what is meant by um, house file when you've got information saved in different areas of your CRM system. It's not actually in all one central location. Um, and uh, the first thought that popped into my head um, was that rather than just trying to carry out a broad brush approach and just providing them with everything, then there is nothing to stop you to go back and clarify what they mean when they say house file. What information actually are they looking for? Um, the guidance um, produced by the ICO asks you to um, go back to the requester if you're not clear, if the request is particularly broad. And in these cases, if we're saying we don't know what you mean by housing file, that's why I suggest we'd go back, clarify that request, ask what it is that they are looking for, what they think should be in that housing file. And then we can, um, then we can look at that for you. Also, the guidance points towards being able to pause the time for responding. So if you do need to go back and clarify uh, what they mean by house file and um, the time response for responding to that request just pauses for a time so you can seek that clarification. So that's just a useful point. So there's some of the um, common issues when we say um, space with subject access requests, because they often are used as, like I say, a precursor to legal proceedings. So unfortunately, another common issue that comes across our desk from, from housing management's perspective um, is data breaches. But in fact, it isn't really surprising. You handle a really large amount of quite sensitive, confidential and very personal information um, about the tenants and the occupiers that you manage. Um, so it's understandable that mistakes are sometimes made. And with our housing clients, we found that most commonly um, the reason for data breaches is that accidental human error. It's not that there's a systemic problem. It's not that there's any element of criminality involved. It's just simply that there has been um, a mistake down to human error. Regardless of that, it still can cause organisations um, significant problems. And one of these problems that has um, been exacerbated by the GB GDPR is that there is now the ability for individuals to claim compensation for breaches of data protection law. So you don't have to um, show anymore that you've suffered a financial loss in order to be able to claim compensation. So previously, um, under the old regime, uh, you had to show that, for example, you've been a victim of fraud um, and you've lost money to be able to claim compensation. So if a company lost your credit card details and you've been a victim of fraud, then you could claim compensation for that financial element that you have lost that you've suffered. Moving forward, there's been case law um, has progressed and they've said that you don't just have to suffer any financial amount of loss, but it can be enough to show that you're distressed by an organisation's breach of data protection law to claim compensation. And that what is meant by distress, by distress is the threshold is quite low. So if you are upset by a loss of confidence, if you've suffered embarrassment, if you are, um, there's been damage to your reputation, then you've got a claim for distress because of that data breach. The issue we're seeing now is there is not enough of this case law coming through to the higher courts. Um, so we can't give you a good idea of what these claims are valued at um, because there just simply hasn't been enough case law um, there at the moment. So how much these claims are valued, um, we've seen them in the range from £400 up into the tens of thousands for the more serious case and there's no in between. So we've either seen quite a small scale problem or we've seen a huge a really serious significant problem which ended up in people having to be rehoused there's no in between so this provides us quite a difficulty in how much these claims are going to be worth um, but what we would say is that this is something that claimant firms and solicitors are um, jumping on so to speak um, so you might have seen um, in the press where there's been a big um, breach that has hit the headlines and um, then claimant firms are advertising have you been a victim of a data breach this is where we envisage it's going and it's just another element of risk for your organization that's going to have to manage yes what do we do when because i've had a situation recently where um a defendant had a Mackenzie friend and they were um, dealing with me together, but then they had a massive falling out. So her Mackenzie friend sent me a load of criminal information 
relating to the defendant, which clearly I shouldn't have, have been given. Um, what do you think um, I need to do in those sorts of circumstances? Um, well, I suppose in those circumstances, if your Mackenzie friend's an individual, there's not much that um, the your opposition could do because that they can't take action against the individual person because they're not subject to the data protection um, provisions. Um, but ultimately, then you've got access to information. Of course, it's in the conduct of legal proceedings, so you've got that exemption there. Um, if you needed to rely upon it, um, but ultimately it's a decision, a discussion that you're going to have to have with, you, with your client. I think uh, the only thing I'd add, to, yeah, the only thing I'd add to that will be where you do get that sort of accidental overdisclosure, then it's it's a bit of a handle with care situation because if it comes to you as the consequence of a breach, particularly by another organisation, mm. then what you need to be careful of is that you don't compound the breach and you don't become the person that's responsible for that information being widely circulated. Because if the initial breach only comes as far as you, then the, mm. the, that, the data controller that caused the breach by telling you has only told one person. If okay. you then bang that out on some sort of broad circulation list without checking what's in the content, then potentially you're going to take that a lot further. I see. So at the minute, all I've done with it is kept it I haven't read it. I haven't looked at it. Um, do I need? I don't need. Do I need to send it back somehow? It was emailed. I think uh, one of us will give you a ring around about two minutes past three, Sarah, <laughs> when, we, when we've had the chance to put the kettle on. Thank you. <laughs> um, thanks, Sarah. And um, so, yeah, all sorts of issues, as we can see. Um, where we've we've dealt with some particularly tricky ones, where the, the consequences are actually quite serious, um, surround the accidental disclosure of anonymous complainant details. Um, so we have seen these um, in the past, actually, pre-GDPR coming into force. Um, and so, for example, if you see um, if there's an accidental disclosure of anonymous witness details, it might ultimately have to end up in that witness or that complainant um, being rehomed if they're put at risk. Um, but now you can guarantee that not only would uh, you be looking at rehouse, there'd certainly be a complaint to the Information Commissioner's Office, as well as likely claims for compensation. Um, and it's just worth noting that obviously if you are, if the court finds you liable for compensation or you agree to pay cost, um, pay compensation, you're not going to have to have your own cost in defending that claim, but you've also got to pay uh, the other side's uh, legal cost, which you can guarantee will be significant, um, particularly when um, there is no, no bar on the legal cost for claiming for um, data breaches at the moment. So Probably fair, perfect timing. Uh, we just had a very interesting comment on the chat. That uh, we're going to apply uh, Chatham House rules here to say somebody who uh, is attending this uh, webinar has just paid out GDPR compensation of two thousand pounds and is now looking down the barrel of a thirty-two thousand pound mm. claimant costs um, schedule. I've, I've uh, which uh, I, I'm, I'm not a litigator, but I'm I'm hoping you can put a dent in the thirty-two thousand, and uh, hopefully we know somebody who might be able to help you with that. Yeah, I think there's conversations from our own um, litigating department who deal with these claims for housing clients that they, they've said that the other side's costs are significantly disproportionate um, amounts being claimed. So even though they might be successful in a small amount of compensation, um, the lawyer's fees are huge. And um, so it's just another element of, of risk that your organisation just be really careful, particularly around that anonymous complaint and evidence. Um, there are there's lots of technical software in place. Um, so for example, you can get redaction software where you can, if you know you've got an anonymous complainant, you enter their names or any reference to them, their address details, their telephone numbers, and it will automatically redact it. Obviously, um, everyone doesn't have access to those types of resources. So it's just a case of check, check and check again, get a colleague to check. Just because like you say, you don't want to have to be paying out a small amount of compensation and then a huge amount in legal fees as well. Um, so the, the other one, and this is something um, that I, I see regularly, I've been dealing with an issue um, today about CCTV, and I know it causes you a whole world of pain. Um, the common issue that, issue that we see from um, in terms of housing management is complaints from residents about each other's use of CCTV. And it generates a whole lot of complaints between the residents um, and then ultimately the time spent by the, the landlord, the housing management agency, trying to deal with those complaints. 
The starting point is that um, CCTV, which is used in a private domestic property. So that is where the CCTV captures images of um, a, within the boundary of someone's own property. And um, the Data Protection Act, GDPR doesn't apply. So in theory, the tenant can install CCTV that captures boundaries of boundaries of their own property, provided there's nothing in their tenancy agreement which prohibits that or makes you uh, request landlord's consent before you install that CCTV. So far, so straightforward. But the problem we get is where that CCTV goes outside the boundary of that property. So it might capture a street, it might capture a communal area, an entrance or a corridor if you're, if you're in a flat situation. And then the answer there is once it goes outside the boundary of that individual's property, it does become subject to the GDPR and the Data Protection Act and all those obligations that goes with it. So the tenant that's operating that CCTV that is capturing images outside the boundary of their own property will be a data controller for the purposes of the GDPR. And ultimately subject to the same obligations that you are when you're installing CCTV. So they've got to think of ways in which the, they can take into account the privacy um, of other individuals. How can they make that more uh, less privacy intrusive? Um, they have to put up signage to explain that CCTV is in use for, for example, crime prevention purposes. They've got to respond to subject access requests if they get any or deal with um, requests and objections. They need to secure that footage um, safely and securely and delete it after a short period of time. But I say in theory, because that is really difficult to enforce. The um, complainants can complain, um, residents can complain to the ICO about someone's use of CCTV, which goes outside the boundary of the property. But in reality, aside from writing to that occupier and giving them guidance about how to comply with the Protection Act, they're reluctant to get involved. So you've got a problem with enforcement. Therefore, you're best relying on the terms of your tenancy agreement if it's included in there. Um, so there might be a clause in there uh, either prohibiting the use of CDVTV or requesting consent from the landlord. Um, and where, again, where we seem there might be a blanket clause in your tenancy agreement that says um, CCTV must, uh, the, your landlord's con uh, consent must be granted before you install CCTV. Um, where we see problems again is that landlords have difficulty in explaining why they are withholding their consent for CCTV and get accused of being unreasonable. So do you have a process document in place which explains your reasoning behind withholding consent? What are the circumstances in which you say you will not give consent and why is that reasonable? So it's quite acceptable for you to document that you'll withhold consent where it films a communal area because it's really privacy intrusive to those individuals simply walking past and carry out their day-to-day -day basis. The fact that it generates a lot of complaints because people feel that their privacy is being invaded and the fact you can't allow your tenants to commit data, data, breaches of data protection law on your property. So ultimately, it is going to the enforcement of um, individuals' use of CTSB is difficult um, because of the restraints can't by the ICO. But ultimately, if your tenancy agreement documents that you need consent, making sure that you've got a procedure in place for for when that consent will be withheld will be really useful. I had a case recently where the client wanted to not allow CCTV footage because it was felt that the tenant who wanted it, wanted it, uh, there was already neighbour disputes going on and it felt like it would inflame the situation. So it was rejected yeah. um, for that reason, which the tenant was very unhappy about. But Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, it's the, the landlord's property to, and if they're saying well, you can't have it without our consent and that consent has to be reasonable withheld, They've got reasons for for showing that they they are being reasonable um, in in that withheld because ultimately it just will generate complaints between between those individuals. Between neighbours, yeah. Thanks, Can I just ask a question, Beth. Uh, does that include these camera doorbells that you? Yes, can it does. See now, aren't they? Yeah, really popular. And we've had um, there was one particular provider that causes us all sorts of. Uh, uh, problem, not problems, but lots of issues for our for our housing clients, um, particularly if it's installed in flat areas. So you're on your front door, it's obviously showing um, other people's flat front doors as well if it's in, on a corridor. And um, again, 
that is um, ICO guidance says that that type of doorbell camera is classed as CCTV. So it, it's subject to the same provisions that we've, we've just spoken about them. Thank you. Yep. I'll, I'll, also, and I had a look at that provider's terms and conditions actually the other day, and that does state that you know you need to make sure you've got permission of the person who owns that property before you install that, um, before you install that kind of um, doorbell. And um, so that's another point to raise. Well, I think that certainly chimes with the uh, some of the questions we're getting in at the moment. Uh, so the, the, there is a question there. Uh, a couple have come in that we we might usefully take now i think if we're if we're in the middle of this point uh first question is if a cctv owner doesn't comply with the dpa responsibilities can these be enforced in the usual way by complaints to the ico and potentially claims for compensation mm -hmm. uh, that's certainly the case yeah and uh, the other one and this is perhaps crossing over into uh, sarah's domain uh, mm -hmm. if there's no clause in the tenancy agreement about cctv as such can we roll out the nuisance and annoyance clause Certainly, I think if you can demonstrate that the presence of the CCTV is causing nuisance and annoyance to the residents, the neighbours, and even if it's causing nuisance and annoyance to the landlord, then there is an ability to do something about that via uh, breach of tenancy, uh, probably by way of a breach of tenancy injunction, compelling the tenant to take the CCTV down within a specified time. And obviously a breach of that injunction uh, would lead to contempt of court. Uh, whether you'd ever actually be able to evict somebody because of uh, CCTV placed in the wrong place, I, I don't know. But it certainly is something you could look to do, especially if there was other issues in relation to nuisance and annoyance. I think it, the thing to be careful with this is you, you need to have all the facts at your disposal before you jump down that because you can end up in something of a rabbit hole. I remember dealing with a dispute where two neighbours were um, recording with video and audio each other's houses both making ASB complaints against the other and both contending it was personal use for uh, collection of evidence. Mm. So they'd obviously got some advice from somewhere. So they, they weren't for taking it down at the first time of asking. Yeah. And, I find there's uh, a fine was, line between gathering evidence to assist you with your case or irritating the other neighbour beyond. I've got one at the minute where she just keeps, every time she leaves something in the communal area for five minutes, she's taking a, the other neighbour's taking a photograph of it. And, and obviously that's then causing nuisance and annoyance. So I think there is a fine line to be drawn between victims trying to gather information to help you, but then inadvertently uh, causing nuisance and annoyance to the perpetrator. Yeah, and as a, as, as a side issue to this that we um, I won't go into now, but we, uh, we do get questions of uh, people uh, with doorbells, phones, whatever it might be, uh, recording um, the landlord staff when they come to the house to make, uh, to make visits or to undertake repairs. And uh, people are often surprised that uh, it's probably all right for people to do that, depending on what they do with the recording afterwards. Mm. Certainly in one uh, disrepair case, they, uh, they did capture the one repair operative saying, wow, we've really bodged this, let's get away quick. Mm. Um, and then the next time the person saying, what idiot did this last time? So uh, there really wasn't anywhere to go after that. Yeah. Um, we, we did politely suggest it might not have been gathered entirely lawfully, but that, that isn't anything we, we were going to trust our weight to in that case. No. I mean, I don't know if you're going to cover it later on, but it does lead me to the questions I'm getting quite a lot with property condition and the landlord's right to take photographs inside the property. Yeah, the, um, obviously a tenancy agreement is usually going to include standard for about inspecting property Um photographs will provide um you know will go towards that inspection and um, again if the tenant's not in it um you know you can argue that you're not photographing them um but it probably is a condition of property is going to be um that tenant's personal data but ultimately your reason you're not asking for their consent to take their photographs because your reason for for taking that photograph doesn't require your their consent you're doing it to make sure your property is kept in good condition to make sure health and safety of the tenants okay whether you need to take any further legal action so you aren't requiring um uh, yeah. i see thanks Beth. thank you um so just a, a final note on on cctv um there's also um, times where you as a landlord, as a managers, um, are going to want to install CCTV if there is, for example, you've got a number of complaints about a particular issue. 
Um, there is extensive guidance on the ICR website um, and the code of practice about the use of CCTV. Um, and you really need to liaise with your data protection officer if you've got one about um, installing CCTV, because there are a number of steps that need to be gone through before you're installing that, and um, that you'll want to make sure you're considered, particularly if there's a number of contentious elements there and you're likely to get complaints about, about your use of CCTV. You want to make sure you've demonstrated that you can tick all those right boxes first. And then finally, from um, me for today, I just want to touch upon um, information sharing, because I know from some of the questions that we've had um, before this session today, and from um, dealing with Sarah's um, team just generally, that um, a lot of our queries relating you have about information sharing, um, particularly with um, difficulty in accessing information from other organisations. And the point that I always like to make um, and the reassurance that I give is that there is nothing in the Data Protection Act or the GDPR which prevents you from sharing information where you need it for safeguarding, where it's for the welfare of individuals or health and safety. Um, there is plenty of guidance out there. Um, so there's the ICO's um, data sharing code of conduct. There's advice guides for practitioners, all highlighting how data protection should a barrier to justify information sharing. So why are we still getting these problems with third party organisations sharing us information with us if there is all this abundance of guidance out there to say that data protection isn't a barrier to sharing information? And I think that the problem is, is that whilst there might be a framework for doing it lawfully, um, it only gives organisations a power to share information with you there's nothing in there that gives them a, a legal compulsion to give you that information so like i've said there's there are powers in the data protection act to um, disclose information to other organizations and um, so particularly from a housing management perspective you're going to be looking and um, wanting to look at what is known as schedule two of the data protection act 2018 so in there, there are exemptions for information which is relating to um, criminal offend, uh, to com criminal convictions and the prosecution of offenders. Um, so you can information can be disclosed for that purpose under the DPA. You'll also want to look at if you're looking at, for example, liaising with your local authority with social services. There's also um, provision in there for sharing information for the purposes of safeguarding um, children and other individuals who are at risk. So there is provision in there. There's also your, your general legal proceedings provision. Um, and these all point towards powers that you can point towards to give that organisation that you're asking for information on reassurance that information can be disclosed lawfully under the Data Protection Act. The problem that we face um, is that it's only a power to disclose and it's not a legal obligation that's going to compel them to provide you with that information. So whilst you can provide that reassurance, what it boils down to is your relationship with that um, partner organisation. Your relationship with them is going to be really important because you want them to be able to assist you um, in progressing your cases and getting that information that you need. So regulate the use of information sharing agreements is used um, because lots of partner organisations recognise that there's a mutual obligation there. Whilst you might want all information from them, there's going to be a point where they're probably going to want information from you as well. So making it reciprocal, making those obligations work for both sides, um, it provides reassurance that it can be done lawfully and sets out a framework in which that information can be shared and can give instructions of how that information is to be used. And this will assist in them giving comfort to organisations who are providing you with information that that information is going to be treated securely. So if you're looking at entering into um, an information sharing agreement, so they should be, we'd recommend that they are in place with organisations that you are regularly sharing um, information or seeking information with. Um, and if you're looking at entering a new one or looking at revising maybe an old one that's been done some time ago, you'll want to liaise with your data protection officer in the first instance if you've got one and have a look at the ICO's um, code of practice on data sharing. 
This has recently been updated. Um, so to it came into force um, at the end of December last year. Um, so it's now been updated to reflect um, GDPR. And again, there's lots of reassurance in there that data sharing um, is not a barrier you know, data, data protection is not a barrier to information sharing, and it provides lots of information in helping put together those considerations for information sharing agreements and gives you some idea of what you should be looking at before putting those information sharing agreements in place, um, such as whether you need to conduct a data protection impact assessment to assess any, and mitigate any risks. So that is a, enough from me for now. Um, I'm going to hand you over to my colleague Daniel, who's going to discuss in a bit more detail um, some of the things that we think are coming on the horizon and discussing some of your questions in more detail. So thank you very much for listening. Okay, thank you, Bethany. So I uh, have the exciting, trendy, breaking news section of the presentation, um, news that broke in November of last year, the, uh, the white paper and what does that tell us about uh, tenants' right to information. So next slide, please. Thank you very much. So this is the Charter for Social Housing, because in addition to the regulatory framework, the Housing Ombudsman scheme, and every other person and their dog telling you how to run your housing association, what you now need is a Charter for Social Housing uh, to tell you how to look after tenants. Uh, some of us might consider you've been doing that fairly successfully for quite a long time. And if anybody hasn't read the Prime Minister's introduction to this and works in the social housing sector, my top tip will be don't read it. Um, you'll probably just end up punching out your uh, laptop screen. So, uh, yeah, mo moving on smoothly from there. Um, the, it, it addresses a number of very serious issues uh, around health, safety, um, some of the fallout from the Grenfell fire, uh, picking up on the... Uh, the need for better enforcement of the consumer standards versus the financial standards in the regulatory scheme, but then helpfully picks up on the question of access to information. So next slide, please. And it's worth just to pausing uh, to, to consider while I say this next bit. Uh, this was the then Prime Minister Tony Blair's retrospective opinion of what a good idea it was to have introduced the Freedom of Information Act. He also went on to say uh, it was only ever used by journalists, not by people. So in his words, it was like somebody hitting you with a stick and then you say, here, let me hand you a mallet so you can hit me more effectively. And certainly I would suggest to anyone who works in frontline ASB, do not offer anybody a mallet in any circumstances. It's not the way forward. The, the issue here is that while this is somebody's opinion of what a poor idea the Freedom of Information Act might have been, the Freedom of Information Act is the very model that the government is looking to in describing this new right of access that it thinks social housing tenants should have. So next slide, please. So what you have coming soon, forthcoming attractions, your very own RP specific, not the proper Freedom of Information Act, um, AirSat's diet version of uh, the FOIA, the precise mechanics of which we don't know, but we can start to make a few guesses. So next slide, please. This is the commitment that is in the white paper, a new access to information scheme. So very clearly not making the Freedom of Information Act applicable to RPs. Uh, we know from previous case law and also in relation to the environmental information regulations, the Poplar Housing case, that um, access to information also doesn't apply to private RPs and social landlords. What the government suggests in the white paper is that tenants who have a local authority or an ALMO as their landlord would be able to use the Freedom of Information Act. And so everyone else should be able to do something similar, but not exactly the same. So as we all know, having two different types of law addressing quite probably the same thing, depending on who's asking, um, is always going to be helpful. Uh, we'll find out later we're also going to have two appellate bodies making different decisions about what happens when different organisations say no. Uh, so this has the, um, well, from a lawyer's point of view, this has the um, potential to get quite interesting. Uh, from those of you who do this in the real world, this has the uh, potential for being an absolute pain. 
Uh, there's also a requirement for uh, income and expenditure breakdown to be published alongside tenant satisfaction measures, which starts to feel a lot like the proactive scheme of publication um, requirement that's in the FOI as well. So next slide, please. The new scheme will allow tenants or their representatives. So that's going to be interesting to see exactly who that might be. Might, might they be represented by, for example, campaigning journalists, uh, charity groups, um, or does that just mean tenants or their legal representatives, in which case we're probably broadly where we were with data protection. This appears to be much more limited than the Freedom of Information Act because under FOIA, anybody can ask. This seems to be halfway between freedom of information and data protection because under data protection, you can only ask about yourself, whereas under FOI, you can ask about anything in the public domain. What this appears to say is you can ask things to your landlord. So that sits broadly in the middle. Uh, also, information held by subcontractors and uh, freedom of information can reach out to organisations who are holding information on behalf of a public body. So that's um, one loophole closed off. So regrettably, what you can't do is move your entire CRM system onto your uh, gas servicing contractors database and contend you don't hold it anymore. Uh, before anybody tries that, A, please don't do that because they're usually not very good guardians of it. But secondly, it won't work. Uh, there will be time limits, surprise, surprise. Uh, and there will be exemptions under which a landlord may refuse to disclose information. And then the intriguing phrase, broadly aligned with the exemptions under the Freedom of Information Act. So broadly aligned, I'm interpreting as meaning not the same, but hopefully similar. So that would include things like um, commercial confidentiality. Interestingly, under the FOIA, uh, legal professional privilege is not an absolute bar to disclosure, and you have to go through the public interest test. I'm pleased to say, so far as I'm aware, no uh, disputed privilege point has yet failed the public interest test, which is uh, nice to think uh, that we're at least doing something in the public interest and the legal profession, which not everybody would always agree. So could I have the next slide, please? And it's important that the tenant can challenge that decision. Of course it is. Because if tenants don't have somewhere to take their complaint, they're just going to keep complaining to you however often you answer it. So the first stage is going to be an internal review by the landlord. And then we're not going to the, uh, the ICO, who would deal with disputes under the Data Protection Act. We're going to the housing ombudsman. And beyond the housing ombudsman, if they think there's anything seriously wrong, they are going to the RSH. So interestingly, if you had a tenant who simultaneously, and why wouldn't they if they were properly advised, sends you a single request document, part of which is a request for personal information, therefore probably a subject access request, and the rest of which is more in the sphere of the new right to access of tenancy information, and they don't like what you say in answer to the entire letter, they might have to take their complaint to two different places, depending on which part of your answer they didn't like. The FOI and the Environmental Information Regulations have got provisions in them, Sections 40 and Regulation 13, which send you back into the Data Protection Act if what you've made is really a subject access request. So it remains to be seen whether what the government's going to try to do here is oust the jurisdiction of the ICO by not including that triage clause. We don't know yet, but I'm sure we will find out soon enough. Okay, next slide, please. And we, uh, we're going to start with the uh, questions that we received in advance, and we're going to move on to the ones that are lining up in the Q&A section. So if you have submitted one of those, we have seen them, we're coming to them. Uh, there's been some uh, interestingly rapid typing going on between the panellists to determine which of us is going to answer them. And while one of us is attempting not to answer one of them, she might still end up with it. So the first question that we got was to talk about the new right of information. So hopefully that's something that I've been able to shed a bit of light on just now. What's interesting is that the government says, if only everybody had the same right to information as social housing tenants of a local authority. So Gemma, during her time as uh, in the legal department at Blackpool Council, uh, had a lot of dealing with uh, Blackpool Coastal Housing. So what I'm hoping is that Gemma might be able to give us uh, her experience of when social housing tenants did have access to the FOIA. How did that work out? Yeah, I mean, it's quite interesting, really, because um, I don't think a lot of them were actually aware of that right in the first place. 
So, um, you know, they didn't understand that the BCH was considered to be an ALMO and it was under the local authority and, they, and therefore they had that right under FOI. So it was very unusual that we would get tenant requests in relation to the FOIA from, from them. But, we, you know, there was the odd occasion where there were people on fishing expeditions who perhaps were relatives of the tenants or um, as well organisations um, who were trying to fish for information on the tenants' behalf. Um, so they would go about it that way, but it was very unusual for the tenants themselves to raise a freedom of information request, really. <clears throat> Thank you, Jim. It's, uh, it's interesting to see how that's going to work, because particularly the legislation at the moment has a requirement effectively on the body holding the information to classify the request in a sensible manner so as not to create a technicality and refuse it. So what will be interesting is if you get a request for information, will it be incumbent on you to decide, is this a subject access request or should I really deal with it under the new tenant's right to access? Because a lot of pre-litigation phishing requests about repairs, etc., we can fend off at the moment because the FOIA and EIR don't apply. If the tenant's right to information is going to come into play, then we may not be able to knock those back anymore. So we might need to give some thought to how we're going to deal with them. So moving on to our next question. And as the lead author on uh, our book about GDPR and homeworking, I'm uh, going to invite Bethany to see if she has any comments on this one, assuming I haven't put up too cryptic an image here. I'm not hearing that at the moment. I've, that, that said, I have a very cheap headset on, so that may, it may just be me. Right, well, meantime, while we, while we hopefully re-establish sound to uh, the, the central command bunker where Bethany is, uh, the two common breaches that we're seeing at the moment are, firstly, video conferencing. And uh, for anybody who uh, attended our recent um, webinar on a, a, a case study based on a, a fictitious video conferencing-based breach, this is all too easy to achieve. Um, people are not necessarily turning up all of the security settings on whichever conferencing platform they are using. People are having things visible in the background. Uh, there's been a recent um, instance uh, with the new presenter of Women's Hour on Radio 4, who was uh, sharing with the production team some criticism of a guest who was coming on, and that guest has already joined the Zoom call that they were on and decided they didn't want to be a guest anymore. So... It's uh, a bit like the problems we used to have with, are we sure this conference phone has hung up properly before we start commenting? Uh, but even more so. Uh, the second thing over on the right there uh, is uh, fishing with a pH. Um, my chapter of the, uh, the home working book. So I think if I plug it twice, I think that's all the marketing department are going to ask me to do. Available at all good booksellers. <laughs> Certainly available on Amazon. Um, one of the issues we're finding is with a lot more people going to remote working, a lot more people are having to use login uh, procedures that they're not necessarily familiar with so that it's not as easy for them to spot whether they're seeing the right one or not and if you're using um, Microsoft 365 for example for the first time and you see a message that 365 requires you to input your password it's very difficult for you to know whether it does or it doesn't uh, so there's a lot more people doing a lot more logging in on unfamiliar systems and uh, potentially on home devices that aren't carrying the same level of security that you might want to see uh, but we're not going to launch into BYOD, bring your own device, because that is an entirely separate webinar, which could go on for considerably longer than this one. The next one, thank you, Bethany, is um, can we comment on the contractual relationship between um, RSLs, RPs, uh, TMOs and private housing providers? So what we've got here is the uh, distinction we all always have to try to make between on the left, the controller, and on the right, the processor. Uh, it's very important to understand in what capacity you are acting and in what capacity the other party is acting. Uh, the trick here is not to fall into the trap of assuming that the verb processing only applies to processors. Both controllers and processors do processing. So uh, it does come down to who is making the key decisions about why and how the information is going to be stored, used, retained, and ultimately disposed of. And if there's one particular party calling the shots, then that party is either the controller amongst processors or the controller amongst lead controllers. 
This gets particularly interesting where you have uh, multi-party choice-based letting schemes. And I'm uh, pleased to say that uh, I occasionally have to look at those, but not as often as Bethany does. And that's quite interesting because what you've got there are multiple housing providers, all of whom are data controllers in their own right, coming together in a system that's probably hosted primarily on one of their IT systems, making that controller the lead controller amongst joint controllers. A lot of it comes down to looking at the genuine nature of the contract between the two parties and then determining whether that's a controller to controller sharing, a joint controller, or controller to processor. And for particular uh, fiddliness, we often end up having to use a clause that says, when you are acting as a processor, do this, and when you're acting as a controller, do that. Don't fall into the trap of thinking that because you're paying somebody to do something for you, uh, such as manage property, that makes them a processor. It genuinely doesn't in that case. They are very likely to be a controller. So if you roll out the standard uh, processor requirements of the GDPR Article 28, you probably won't have the right contract. Um, I'm conscious time is moving, so hopefully that sheds a little light on that one. Our next question is uh, something that Bethany uh, covered earlier. What is the definition of a housing file? And uh, the key thing here is uh, clarity and keeping your records. So if you are dealing with one of those requests and you're taking a view as to what you're including and what you're not including, then make a note of that because in our experience, if you do have to then explain that decision to the ICO, they will have heard the complainant's side of the story. And it's quite good for you to be able to say, we did think about this. We did go through a sensible process of analyzing our response. And this is what we withheld. And this is why we did it. Uh, that said, get it clarified if you possibly can with the person who's making the request, as Bethany suggested. Uh, on the right, I'm no engineer, but I'm reliably informed that is the timing uh, element of an engine. And timing is key here, as Bethany also alluded to earlier. What you can't do is wait until day 29 of your month and then decide you want to go back and uh, explore the scope of the request a little further. The thing to do is to respond as quickly as you possibly can. And we find this is a very effective way, particularly of dealing with internal SARs, where you might be able to say to the requester, presumably you don't need us to bother with emails that you've either already sent or received and thus already seen. And in that case, particularly on an internal request, you can sometimes take out about two thirds of the volume. So next slide, please. Um, fans of the uh, country rock supergroup, the Highwaymen, uh, we'll notice them down there on the right. Um, Johnny Cash, Willie Nelson, Chris Christopherson, and Waylon Jennings. Uh, for anyone, of course, who didn't recognise them straight away. Uh, so is the, the question here is, is this just outright daylight robbery by the police? Are they charging you for something they shouldn't be able to charge you for? Well, the short answer to why they're charging you is because they can. Uh, this isn't a situation in which you've got the ability to make the equivalent of a subject access request or an FOIA request. So lacking the statutory right to make the request, then it is going to be more of a challenge. Uh, this, again, is something that I think Gemma may be able to um, give us some thoughts on because it's, uh, it's a common experience for those in uh, housing management and also for those in local authority practice. Yes, I can't believe you talked about Zoom and didn't mention Joe Wicks. How could you not do that? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, obviously, when we work with the local authority, we work very, very closely in partnership with the police and other organisations. And it very much, like Bethany said before, relates to the relationship that you have with them. Now, I know it's a pain, but I do sort of understand an element of this, because depending on what's being requested and how old it is and where it might be, etc., it can be a bit of a drain on resource. So a lot of the time, if they're charging for that, it's because it is taking up officer time. It is going to be taking time to get that information and get it over to you. So I do have a slight bit of sympathy with them. Um, but it very much does rely on the relationship that you have. And, and, and with working in the local authority, obviously we had that lucky situation where they needed information from us as much as we needed it from them. Um, so they were quite forthcoming. But I mean, Dan's quite right. They are within their rights to be able to do that. Um, I think perhaps you, need, you can question whether or not they're charging a reasonable amount. And I think that that potentially is a question that should be asked. 
um, as it would be in any situation. You know, you're not going to go into a shop and pay over the odds, are you, for something? So I think it is worth doing that. But it is also trying to work on those relationships and trying to make that connection. And also as well, those uh, data sharing agreements, that's a vital part of it. Because if you have one of those agreements in place, you know, they've actually signed up to it. Um, worst case scenario in my day, I used to go and knock on the chief exec's door and said, here, we have a word with your counterpart in the cop shop, please, because I'm not getting anywhere. So, um, you know, there are ways around it, but unfortunately it is very frustrating. But like I say, there is an element of it I can kind of understand. I find I have to be a dog with a bone, really. I just have to not give up until I've got what I want. Uh, and often I think it can be helpful if you get a solicitor to send the email. So, because sometimes my client might have been trying for ages and then they ask me to do it uh, and I get a, a better result. So sometimes that's worth doing as well. Yeah, and I think uh, ultimately, potentially at the end of the line, if you really need the information and somebody is standing in the way of you advancing your case, then potentially you've got the possibility of going for a third party pre-action disclosure order, uh, which is incredibly expensive and embarrassing for everybody concerned because it involves you getting your dysfunctional information sharing relationship in front of a judge who's going to take a view that one or both parties are to blame. So it is a way of forcing the issue, but ideally that isn't where you want to be going with this, um, if you possibly can. And certainly uh, our colleague Darren Burton, with many of uh, with whom many of you may be familiar, does a lot of work around interagency collaboration, uh, data sharing, and early stage cooperation is definitely a part of that. So if anybody is having particular um, problems with this, uh, he may be able to shed a bit of practical thoughts on that as part of our uh, Ask Forbes service. So next slide, please. So we have uh, roughly three minutes left. And before I even invite any more questions, we have a number of other questions. Um, uh, first question is, is one I think Sarah can field relatively quickly and it's whether uh, information that is subject to privilege in relation to legal proceedings becomes disclosable after the litigation has finished uh, yes uh, I, I did answer that via text uh, to whoever asked the question but yes uh, in my, my view is that it's always privileged it doesn't matter if the case is closed any information between you and your solicitor is privileged forever that's my understanding. good work <laughs> there you have it uh, to, to, to the grave, we will take it with us. Um, excellent stuff. Uh, second question was whether we've uh, seen any cases of people relying on uh, human rights legislation, uh, invasion of privacy type cases, and European case law, as well as the ordinary garden variety GDPR uh, distress claim. And I think the answer is uh, the better informed solicitor is likely to plead all of these given the opportunity. Uh, certainly data protection breaches are now being routinely pleaded in uh, defamation libel cases. Because uh, if you said something about me that you shouldn't have said and wasn't true, then you must have violated the accuracy principle. Because if it isn't true, it isn't correct. So people are finding ways to effectively mix and match as many of these claims as possible. Uh, the point is rightly made uh, in, I think, the questions follow up to their own question, which is if you're not a public authority and you're a private RP, then potentially the Human Rights Act is something less of a concern, but that invasion of privacy law is potentially still out there. Uh, as my old contract law lecturer used to say, a lot of these cases are about oil tankers and diamonds because those were cases worth taking to court. And it's certainly the case that a lot of the invasion of privacy cases are usually brought by celebrities who you would think would be too rich to care, but turn out to be every bit rich enough to uh, drag Johnny Depp through the courts for several weeks or whichever other celebrity they want to litigate with. So uh, next question that we had uh, was, if we're mentioning in, term, uh, in context of the new right to access for tenants to information, uh, what are we thinking is going to come under the heading of representative for a, uh, a tenant? We don't know at this stage. Uh, what we're hoping is we're going to find some more information as that legislation comes forward. Uh, very interesting that Sarah mentioned the Mackenzie friend, um, uh, friends, neighbours, uh, members of your uh, tenant voice or tenant consultation panel may find themselves in some sort of intermediary role. Maybe that sort of person could could end up being drawn into this. We'll have to have a look at that, and we're, we're alive to this as one of the questions we're going to try to get the answer to as we find out. And uh, we'll find out finally uh, questions we have here. 
Uh, what's the best way to approach repeated subject access requests from the same person? Now, I'm hoping at this stage that uh, Bethany's microphone might be back on because I know this is a topic on which she is very keen. Damn it, ladies and gentlemen, you are back with me. Um, uh, the answer is that you are allowed to treat repeated requests differently if it is a repeated request for the same information, except where, and you, you do need to take this into account, where the information is changing over time such that the request when made the second or third time might actually produce a different result. So if you have got a rapidly developing uh, ASB case file, shall we say, and somebody is asking week on week, well, what do you now have on me? Uh, you might actually have a lot more than you had a week ago. So it might be that your answer to that question today is legitimately different to what it might have been a while ago. It is possible to aggregate uh, the effect and the, the burden that requests are placing on you. The disproportionate effort exemption has gone. It used to be in the Data Protection Act previously, isn't in the new one than the GDPR, but we are allowed to refuse or charge for, uh, so... Uh, if it's good enough for the police, it's also good enough for you. You can potentially charge for access to uh, information on a subject access request uh, where it is um, excessive or unfounded. So not quite as good as the frivolous and vexatious exemption under the Freedom of Information Act. And again, to come back to the new access to information right, we're going to have to see whether that kind of wording makes it in there. Because I think if we do get something along the lines of vexatious, then as Sarah pointed out in her introduction, we know what vexatious is in the context of housing. And well, in fairness, I could probably ask everybody who's attending here to give me their top six vexatious complainants and they would know them by probably their first names. So we'll see where that goes. But certainly, if somebody is asking for the same thing over and over again, it's imposing a burden on you. There's no new information coming out. You are in a position to start hardening your line in responding to those. So I think we are ever so slightly over for time. So I think that picks up all the questions we've had in. So thank you, everybody, for your uh, your time and attendance today. We hope you found that useful. Uh, there is a recording of the session, which we're hopefully going to circulate in due course, assuming our background technology is going to work slightly better than some of our microphones have been working in the course of this. Um, what we will do is that we might be able to put another slide or two into the presentation so that you will have the benefit of the better answers that Bethany would have given you rather than the ones that you actually got from me. So once again, thank you everybody for your uh, uh, contributions. And if there's anything we can do to help you going forward, uh, you know where to find the whole team at Forbes. And thank you again and good afternoon.